This conference will now be recorded. Hi all, we, we are going to give it just another minute or two before we get things going. Great. Well, we're going to go ahead and get things started here. Um, I think we will have most of you um, on mute, but we can unmute you for questions at the end of the, the webinar. Um, please feel free also to use the, uh, the chat feature to ask questions um, throughout, and, and we'll do our best to monitor those and then and stop as appropriate. Um, my name is Greg Johnson. I'm with the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Um, welcoming you here for our um, Agricultural Diversion Demand Methodology uh, webinar. So these are really designed to give you uh, an update on what we are doing with our technical analysis um, to the Colorado Water Plan. So this is uh, what was formerly known as the Statewide Water Supply Initiative, SWSI, um, and we have been basically rebranding everything to really fit within the umbrella of the water plan um, as we update the technical information for this. Um, so today I'm going to go through a little bit of background on some of the process and some of the methodology for the whole study um, that we are doing. Um, there's a lot more information on this particular um, background of, of everything that we're doing um, that was done with actually the first webinar that we did, and that is posted on our website. I'll give you a little bit more information on that in a minute. Um, then I'm going to hand things over to uh, Matt Lindbergh with Brown and Caldwell um, and Kara Sobieski with Wilson Water Group uh, to really walk through a lot of the details um, on how we are doing the calculations this time for the analysis. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we did do a, an overview webinar. The, the first one that we had was on February 19th. Um, a YouTube video of that is posted on our website. Um, that included a look at the population data, which we have released, um, which is also on the website. Um, these are actually on the Colorado Water Plan website, which is linked uh, directly from the front page of our Colorado Water Conservation Board website. Um, there's a, a big blue box on the left-hand side of that website. So click on that, you'll go to the Colorado Water Plan website, um, and then you can find these um, different webinars with the, the video of, of all of those. Um, we, in March, walked through the municipal industrial data and methodologies, um, and uh, that also um, is posted. A lot of good information there. And then uh, today, of course, we're going through agricultural data. Um, stay tuned in May for the environmental data and methodologies, and then we'll be following up with the final webinar in June uh, to really walk through some of the tools that we have and, and the next steps um, as we prepare to release the study in July of this year. Um, so just, just a quick summary of kind of where this all came from and, and where we're headed. Um, in 2017, uh, we really uh, started the, the engagement process in earnest with technical advisory groups, um, with the roundtables, uh, members from the roundtables, various technical experts, uh, to really help guide this whole methodology process. Since we were doing things very differently this time, since we were using the, the Colorado Decision Support System models, um, and then really quantifying a scenario planning approach, um, we needed a lot of feedback on how we were actually doing this. Um, so engage the, 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 uh, the support and the, um, the input from, from the technical advisory groups, got a lot of, of great feedback through that process, um, had a number of roundtable presentations throughout the state in 2018, and then in 2019, this year, um, we've been working with a, an implementation group with roundtable members um, from across the state to really help guide 
um, then how we will use this data moving forward and then pivot into an update of the basin plans. Um, so we do have these technical web webinars that are all recorded and posted, um, and that includes the, the working group, I should add, the implementation working group. All of those webinars are posted as well, so that information is on the same uh, website that we have. Um, and then this will certainly be an iterative process moving forward as we update the basin plans um, and really figure out um, how all this data goes into informing the, the process moving forward um, and ideally informing uh, the, the, the selection of projects, the identified projects and processes to really meet those gaps in each of the basins. Um, so I, I mentioned briefly that, that we are um, changing our messaging and, and our, our, our real look and feel of everything that we're doing, that this is all part of the water plan itself. So there's just different aspects to the Colorado water plan. Um, we are in the analysis and technical update phase right now. So we will be releasing this, this study um, in July of this year. Um, and then there will be other bits and pieces after that. For example, we've got some uh, data visualization work that we're really excited about um, that will be um, on the website eventually within the next um, six to nine months, ideally, that, that will kind of follow up with some more innovative ways of displaying the data. Um, and then, as I had mentioned, we, we will be pivoting into an update of the basin plan um, for each of the roundtables as well. Um, and then finally, updating the, the comprehensive uh, water plan itself. Um, so that table 11-1 that's on the right there um, it was taken directly from the water plan itself. The, this is the final chapter of the water plan that, that really sets forth the planning process moving forward um, and what year we will actually initiate, start the, the updates to each of these different pieces of the water plan. So we're doing our best to stay true to that, um, understanding, of course, that each of these different components um, does you know, certainly take a fair amount of time. Um, and, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, hand things over to Matt Lindbergh, who is our, our project manager with Brown and Caldwell. Um, he's been doing a great job of really uh, managing the whole technical team on this, um, this, this major study. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, before we get to our uh, featured part of today's webinar, uh, I thought I'd say a few words about the uh, overall methodology that we're taking for this technical update, and also talk a little bit about the goals of the technical update. Um, as Greg mentioned, this is the first update that has been done uh, since the rollout of the three-phase approach, um, doing all this within the context of, of Colorado's water plan. And uh, you probably remember, you know, in prior SWAZIs, uh, they included a mix of technical analyses, but also implementation recommendations and policy considerations, and a lot of those things have now been moved into other uh, phases of the overall water planning process. So, for example, implementation recommendations. That's something that basins are going to uh, develop collaboratively in their basin implementation plans. And so, as a result, this technical update is really focused on uh, development of data sets and tools uh, as opposed to developing strategies and, uh, for example, portfolios of solutions. Again, that's something that basins are going to take care of in their basin implementation plan. Uh, one of the biggest changes you're going to see in this uh, technical update is the incorporation of scenario planning. And uh, in the bottom center of your screen there, you see a little uh, cone diagram that illustrates how uh, we're going to approach this. Uh, I'll take a, uh, just a quick second to mention that uh, this little diagram was taken from a fact sheet uh, that describes scenario planning and our gap analysis methodology, and that appears uh, in the top center. Uh, there's another fact sheet that shows up, and there's uh, another six of those that you can find on the CWCB's website or um, on the water plan website that describe the various components of uh, the technical update study and uh, how we're approaching this from a high level. Um, so back to scenario planning. So that, uh, that, that little cone diagram shows 2018 on the left and out to 2050 uh, on the right. And each one of those letters represents a different uh, future state, a uh, different planning scenario. Scenario planning uh, acknowledges that the uh, future is driven by a number of different considerations, and each one of those considerations have a number of uncertainties associated with them. So in scenario planning, we develop a view of what the future looks like, and then we assess what our uh, supplies, demands, 
and gaps are in that future. And uh, we don't assume that one future is more likely than another. We assume that they're all equally plausible. Uh, one of the uh, more significant drivers of our future state is how we, uh, what we assume the climate is going to look like. What's our water supply look like? What are our uh, uh, climatological conditions? And uh, we've, for the purposes of the technical update, assumed three different uh, projections. And you can see those described in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, two scenarios, the business is, as usual and the weak economy, are going to assume that our climate in the future is pretty similar to what we've seen in the recent past, so uh, designated as current conditions. We have two scenarios uh, at the bottom of that list there that assume a uh, more hot and a more dry future climate condition. And then we have one scenario that assumes our climate is going to be somewhere in between that hot and dry assumption and what we've seen in the past. So incorporating the climate, incorporating a number of different planning scenarios with a wide variety of drivers is going to require that we have uh, some pretty robust uh, analysis tools. And this time around, we're incorporating the uh, hydrologic models that had been made available via the Colorado Decision Support System. And Greg mentioned that. And we're going to use those to efficiently assess gaps and it's also going to give us a really robust set of output data that is going to let us, you know, not only look at variable hydrology within a scenario, you know, what do we expect under wet, normal, dry conditions, uh, but also compare those results uh, across scenarios. So next slide, please. Um, the uh, goals, just a few words about the overarching goals of this update were uh, you know, primarily trying to develop a consistent statewide framework for looking at our future supplies, demands, gaps. Um, and that framework then will be uh, good uh, and robust tools and data sets for roundtables to use when they update their basin implementation plans. Uh, the water plan also mentioned uh, several other goals that uh, the technical update is incorporating. One, looking at drivers that affect our uh, future and uh, setting the foundation for future monitoring of those drivers, uh, incorporating scenario planning, which we're talking about right here, and also really leveraging the uh, tools that the state has invested in um, in the Colorado Decision Support System. So a couple of words then about uh, what the results of this study will look like. And of course, one of the primary results that uh, we focus on are, are the gaps. <clears throat> and the gap is going to look different this time than it has uh, in Swazi 2010 and previously. Uh, as you recall, sort of on the left side of the screen here, um, the uh, municipal and self-supplied industrial gap in 2050 look at uh, additional uh, municipal and industrial demands that we're going to see beyond present day. And then also considering how much yield we'll get from the projects that we have identified to meet those future demands. The difference is the gap. And you've seen this wedge diagram in the lower left to describe that. In this technical update, we're going to, as we described, uh, look at five different scenarios. We're going to incorporate a number of different types of modeling analyses to quantify what we will uh, expect under these uh, different scenarios. Um, and if you've read the, the water plan and read about these uh, future scenarios, you'll, you'll see that in the water plan, it was all a narrative description of what we'll see in the future. One of the biggest challenges of this project was to take that narrative and turn it into numbers. We needed to interpret those scenarios, uh, quantify the input data, and then uh, model those scenarios to look at what our supplies, uh, demands, and gaps will be in the future. Um, and so using these tools then, uh, we will have, as I mentioned before, a very robust uh, data set that uh, hopefully is going to be a, a great um, a source of information and tool for basin implementation plans. And so this is really exciting stuff. Um, a uh, foundational piece of this, though, is the uh, uh, agricultural diversion demand. It's a big driver of the system. And so 
With that, I'll uh, introduce Kara Sobieski. She's a principal with the Wilson Water Group and one of the premier uh, modelers uh, in the state, and we're really glad to have her on the team. And she's going to tell you about agricultural diversions and marine methodology. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so I, you know, as Matt and, and Greg alluded to, we're, we're here to kind of talk about the agricultural diversion demand. Um, and so I will also re reiterate uh, their statement where please, if you can chat questions as we go through, um, please don't hesitate to do so. So um, just go ahead and chat those in and we'll address them um, to the entire group, uh, particularly if you see something on a slide or hear something um, that you have a question about. So. Here, we'll, we'll go ahead and dive right into it. So what I want to kind of talk about today, I want to lay out for you guys. Um, first, we're going to talk about really what is an agricultural diversion demand. Um, and, and, you know, things are kind of different this go around, and so we will hit on how it's different than the previous uh, Swazi efforts. We're going to look at what we have for current results. Um, so basically where we are right now, it serves the, as the foundation for our comparisons to the planning scenarios. The next thing we'll do is look at our planning scenario adjustments. So we'll go through at a high level um, kind of some of the factors that we, that we use to adjust the agricultural diversion demands for the future planning scenarios. Um, we'll go through some high level planning scenario results um, just so we can see what those a different agricultural diversion demands look like in the future. And then we'll briefly hit on what we're kind of considering as the agricultural gap. Um, you know, again, kind of a new thing this go around um, and talk about how we're trying to estimate that gap using some of the modeling tools. So we have a lot to get through. Um, so first off, what is an agricultural diversion demand? Um, what we defined it as, is the amount of water supply that needs to be diverted or pumped to meet the full crop irrigation water requirement. This is basically the amount of water at the head gate and at the well that you would need to divert or pump, regardless of physical and legal availability at this point. We'll get to that you know, at a, at a couple slides down. So right now, if everybody lived in a perfect world, how much water would you need? So that's kind of our basis for everything? What is our demand that we're trying to meet? Um, so how do we define that? So we rely primarily on information developed by the state. Um, so we're looking at information that's been developed by the Colorado Water Conservation Board, by the Division of Water Resources, information that's stored in HydraBase, which is the state's water resources database. Um, we're using information from stakeholders. We're using all sorts of information that we're going to try and, and try and get to. Um, so the first thing that we're going to look at is using the acreage data sets, and they are developed by CWCB and DWR um, on fairly incremental basins. They're they're now on a five-year track, and those acreage data sets delineate all of the irrigated acreage statewide, um, both with crop type. They assign uh, flood irrigation or flood or sprinkler irrigation, so irrigation type. They delineate um, or they define also uh, the supply, so what surface water and or groundwater supply is used to meet that parcel. So this data set in itself, it's a spatial tool, but we kind of, we, we format that for use. You know, we, we query all of it out and format it for use in our tools, um, but it's, it's a huge, uh, important piece of data that we use. It's the foundation of this. Then we look at climate data. Primarily, we're relying on data from NOAA. It's also being stored um, in HydraBase, uh, but there's also plenty of other climate data um, that's developed by the state, COAGMET, um, lots of other data networks that, that are stored in there, but we're primarily relying on, on NOAA data. So we use um, this crop type and this acreage and climate data, and we are using the state's consumptive use tool, which is called state CU, and we put all of this in there, and we basically are looking to develop the potential crop consumptive use. So statewide, how much water do we need to grow these crops? Then we look at precipitation data to see how much of that crop consumptive use is getting met from effective precip, and then the resulting uh, piece of data that comes out of that is our irrigation water requirement. So now that we have the foundation of what the crops want, we need to figure out 
how we can translate that to a head gate or a wellhead basically demand. So we rely on um, information from historical consumptive use analyses to understand irrigation practices, floods, sprinklers, conveyance losses, all of the things that get wrapped up into what we refer to as a system efficiency number. So all of the losses um, that occur while you're trying to deliver, while producers are trying to deliver water um, to the farm level. And we need that number because we're taking that IWR, that irrigation water requirement, and we're going to what I refer to as back it up to the head gate. We take IWR and divide it by that system efficiency number. And that is our agricultural demand. Um, it's important that we that we remember all of these individual components because we have acreage, we have IWR, we have efficiency, because these are all the knobs that we can turn in the planning scenarios. So you'll hear me use these terms over and over again. Um, so that's really how we're coming to an agricultural diversion demand. I want to take a minute to talk about what this demand is not. Um, it is certainly not the maximum water rights. This is not trying to meet every single uh, absolute senior, junior, conditional um, water right that we have in the state of Colorado. This is an acreage-based number, and it's it's really relying on the most recent um, 2015 acreage coverages that we have. Um, it's also not based on historical diversions. Um, so, and I mentioned that because that's one of the things that they used in the previous Swazi uh, effort. Uh, historical diversions have shortages already built into them, physical shortages, legal shortages. Um, they also just have irrigation practices, of uh, following crop types, everything that goes into that number. We're trying to do a what-if scenario, so we don't want those, those diversions um, to, to be basically predisposing our results to these historical practices or historical shortages. Um, we fully recognize that producers um, do not receive full supplies currently. Um, that, that has not been forgotten, overlooked, or otherwise, because um, I'm sure uh, folks that are listening on the phone recognize that if they got all the water that, we, that they needed, we certainly um, wouldn't be doing as much agricultural planning as we, as we are going to in this effort. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the existing shortages that, that uh, producers currently live with, and then those shortages that may, that gap, that may get bigger as we look into the planning scenarios. So that's, that's I know it's a lot. We're gonna start out big and then the rest will go faster, I promise. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So again, I just wanted to hit on, you know, kind of where our data, it's all publicly available. Um, this is information that we get. This is the, the CDSS, the Colorado Decision Support System website. We use the GIS data that's available. We use the climate data that's available. We use historical and current information that's stored under structures. Um, we query all that information out. We use uh, the TS tool and state DMI, which are just tools that we use to format data, their data management interfaces, and we read that into that state CU tool. Um, I point folks to the to the CDSS website. Um, I do have to put a plug in that they recently won an award for excellence in interactive media production, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, but there is an immense amount of publicly available data on this website. Your water rights, your irrigated acreage, your climate data, all the models, all the tools, everything, you know, this is kind of the hub um, that helps me do my job. So that's kind of where all that comes from. So how is this different from Swazi 2010? Um, so I think maybe just the easiest way to, to talk about what happened in Swazi 2010 is they really were looking at the demands at the field level. So they were looking as, from a demand perspective, they were looking at an irrigation water requirement. And so, you know, from that perspective, we're, you know, relatively close, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but needless to say, now that we're changing the definition of what the demand is, the demand results that we will see from this Swazi effort will be significantly different um, and significantly larger, as I'll discuss, than they were um, as they were reflected in Swazi 2010. So it brings the basic question of why um, why the change. So we have we have really an improved process. You know, this scenario planning, you know, as Matt alluded to, has to take into consideration a lot of other things. Um, so we're, we're not able to rely on historical information to predict 
future planning. And so in doing so, we have to set a demand that doesn't have these historical, you know, as I said, the, the predisposes that demand to those historical conditions. So we're trying to find that demand that reflects the true amount of water um, needed to meet these agricultural demands. We're using the planning models. You know, it's it's fantastic that the state is is using these tools, and we're able to look at these what if scenarios. But we need to have that headgate demand to be able to, or that well demand to be able to model those. And then, you know, a lot of this is also just consistency with the MNSS and I uh, approach. So their demands are fairly consistently, you know, at what we either refer to as the tap or the head gate, you know, that's being that's delivering water to a meet a municipal or a self-supplied industrial demand. And so we're kind of bringing the agricultural demand to, the, to be on the same level or the same par um, as those. So now we have, uh, you know, basically consistency across all of our all of our demands. Okay, so we're going to I mean, jump right in. So as I mentioned, this current um, agricultural diversion demand um, is really just trying to figure out where we start. And this, you know, kind of this broad overview is, you know, we currently need 13 million acre feet of diversions plus pumping um, to meet, is needed to meet 6.2 million acre feet of irrigation water requirement. And that's um, associated or attributable to over 3.3 million acres of irrigated land. So um, I wanted to just from a basin by basin perspective, the information, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the information there in, in these bar graphs and talk a little bit more about it. Um, the map in the corner, as I refer to these basin boundaries, what I'm what I'm reflecting is the South Platte or the, the Republican or Rio Grande. That's a map for kind of everybody's use so we can understand the areas that we're talking about. Um, but focusing on this graph, uh, you know, we have, we see very clearly our top producing basins from an agricultural perspective, uh, South Platte River, Republican River, Rio Grande, and Arkansas. So a, a fairly significant amount of our acreage is, uh, is in those four basins. Um, so when we start to look at the comparison of acreage, which is in the yellow, to the average IWR, which is in the green, to the average demand or diversion demand, which is in the blue, um, you start to see some differences in, in relativity. You know, why is a blue bar greater or, you know, greater or less than another one relative to the other bars? So I want to spend a little time talking about that. For basins that have significant, um, you know, sprinkler development or basically irrigation systems that have, you know, that currently have relatively high system efficiencies, um, you know, and, and Republican is, is a good example of that. You see that the, uh, the average demand is, is lower relative to its uh, average IWR. For basins where they're predominantly flood irrigated, um, the system efficiencies tend to be lower. And if that's the case, you know, then we need a little bit more water or more water. Uh, so that blue bar becomes a little bit bigger relative to its IWR. Um, I think it's important to remember, we're going to spend some time talking about system efficiencies and how we change them. It's really important to remember that, you know, the amount of water that is diverted to meet an irrigation water requirement uh, is, is by no means a sign of, of how, um, and I just lost my word, uh, is basically no means a sign of how much water is is you know, diverted or, and I don't want to use the word, you know, waste, and I'm air quoting, um, but what we're really looking at is a basin that's, that uses return flows a lot more. You know, they have an irrigation efficiency that isn't necessarily as high as others, and that, that generates a significant amount of return flows. Those return flows accrue back to the system. They're being used by downstream users. They're often coming back later in the season. And so some of those basins, and, and we'll point to some of the Western Slope basins when we look at that, but these are absolutely return flow driven systems. And those late season return flows that are generated by these irrigation practices are critical for other users downstream to be able to divert longer in the season. So I just you know, wanna make sure that that's kind of, kind of out there. Um, 
also a comparison. So the acreage numbers that we're coming up with, uh, the 6.2 million acres, or I'm sorry, the 3.3 million acres is, is very close to what Swazi, uh, the original Swazi 2010 came up with, uh, you know, and our IWRs, our, our IWR values are also very much in line that 6.2 million acre feet. Obviously, as I mentioned, they didn't, de didn't determine a uh, diversion demand number, so we don't necessarily have a comparison for that. So yeah, if there's no questions on that. We're going to go to planning scenario adjust. So as uh, as Matt and other webinars have alluded to, the goal really was to take the Colorado Water Plan um, narratives of each of these planning scenarios and turn them into qualitative numbers. Uh, and you know. We certainly had help doing this. Um, you know, our, our original technical advisory group, uh, you know, was able to take our, our proposed methodology and, and provide lots of good improvements to it to get us where we are. Um, I've met with several stakeholders throughout this process, um, you know, just kind of talking to them about what these narratives look like and how they can be applied specifically to their basins. Um, so that, you know, thank you to everybody that's been involved uh, so far and that has, you know, been willing to spend time and, and answer these questions. Uh, so really what we came down with were five primary adjustments that we were going to make uh, in each basin, if, if applicable, across the planning scenarios. Um, and the goal was to then adjust our agricultural diversion demand um, based on kind of that agricultural needs uh, the, the image of the head gates that are that are there. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we only had so many factors for agriculture that we could adjust. So that urbanization, that planned agricultural projects and the groundwater acreage sustainability adjustments, they are really hitting on acreage adjustments. Climate is going to be applied um, directly to IWR, irrigation water requirement, and I'll talk a little, you know, more about these in the in the next slides. And then that emerging technologies really hits on that system efficiency. Um, I really, you know, I, I did spend uh, a decent amount of time. You know, our firm worked a decent amount of time in each basin to really try to to get these factors to reflect individual parameters in each basin. I don't go through all of that here. I strongly encourage folks interested um, in learning kind of more about this to, to read the agricultural diversion demand documentation that's, that's forthcoming. So, so we'll hit on urbanization. So what is urbanization? Um, you know, there are lots of, of different ways to look at this, um, but the reality is, is that municipals are expect, municipalities are expected to grow, you know, by the 2050 planning scenarios. And we understand that some municipal growth will occur onto currently irrigated agricultural lands. Um, we certainly investigated lots of different options to be able to uh, look at how we could do this. We investigated options on, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Um, we looked at options to tie the municipal growth rates to irrigated acreage being developed in the past. Um, we looked at, you know, trends that had occurred. Um, a lot of that, a lot of those um, approaches would have required understanding how municipalities were going to grow in the future. Um, and so, because we didn't necessarily have that information, um, you know, that was publicly available that we'd be able to use for this effort, we kind of stepped back and we, we basically said, if there is an irrigated acreage parcel um, based on our spatial, you know, GIS coverages within or directly adjacent to the existing municipal boundaries, there's a high likelihood that that would be urbanized by 2050, particularly in basins where we had um, municipal growth. Uh, so that's, that's really the, the basis for what we did for this urbanization. This could very well be a conservative estimate, you know, because municipal boundaries in many areas will likely expand. Um, we certainly didn't try to have an assumption on the direction or magnitude of municipal growth. We weren't trying to pick, uh, you know, which municipalities would grow into certain areas. Um, that was certainly something that was that was beyond the information that we had available. Um, it's important to note that this is only the urbanization of irrigated acreage. Uh, 
we completely understand that growth may occur onto non-irrigated lands too, but that wasn't necessarily going to impact the agricultural demand. Uh, so that's that's kind of the basis and thoughts behind why we ended up where we did with the urbanization uh, component. The tables on the right reflect the urbanization based on this approach, the amount of acreage that we anticipated could be urbanized by 2050. Um, you know, I don't know if it if it necessarily comes to a surprise to anyone to see the the larger number that's occurring in the South Platte, you know, essentially the South Platte and metro areas. Um, you know, in general, we were the 152. Uh, thousand acre number is within range of what the Swazi 2010 results originally had, but theirs was distributed, um, you know, differently. There was a lot more urbanization uh, that they projected on the western slope, and our approach uh, put kind of more of that into the uh, into the South Platte or into the uh, eastern slope. So the other thing that we looked at is, aside from just urbanization, we have the situation where in many basins, and, and particularly in the South Platte and the Arkansas, that we have, we will likely have additional dry up. Um, and this is attributable to irrigated acreage um, served by senior water rights that is either currently in the process of water court of being transferred over to municipal uses or, um, there's a high likelihood that it will be uh, taken out of production by, by 2050. So these numbers were based on stakeholder um, discussions. You know, this isn't, this is something that, that we met with stakeholders in the basin and, and talked about these values um, and felt comfortable with the methodology. Uh, more information again on how these numbers or where this is, this is really um, necessarily uh, going to be impacting the basin is in the documentation in these two basins. Um, but by the time you look at what's urbanized and what may come out because of additional buy and dry practices, we're looking at potentially 230,000 acres uh, that could be reduced by, by 2050. Um, so then, you know, the South Platte, you know, as, as mentioned, is estimated to be the greatest reduction. It's looking at almost 20% of its 850, give or take, thousand acres. So that's a significant number for that basin. Um, but as a whole statewide, when we're looking at the 230, it's about 7% of what that acreage. So we generally took out the urbanized and the buy and dry acreage across all planning scenarios, unless the planning scenario did not reflect municipal growth. Um, and this often, I mean, for smaller areas, um, this may have occurred during the weak economy uh, planning scenario. And in that case, we set the urbanized acreage to zero. So that kind of gives you some uh, kind of understanding of how these would vary across the planning scenarios. So this was a direct impact and a direct reduction to uh, irrigated acreage, just attributable to this component. So the next one that we looked at was the planned agricultural uh, projects that were identified in certain basins. And in this case, the Yampa River Basin and the North Platte River Basin in their basin implementation plans identified specific areas and specific projects where they plan to increase agricultural production. Um, these numbers are slightly, they're similar to Swazi 2010, but slightly less because the basins uh, refined the numbers they had originally provided uh, and actually tied them to specific areas and acreage values. So this would be a direct increase to irrigated acreage in these two basins. And then the last factor that we looked at for um, for an acreage adjustment was the groundwater system, I mean, the groundwater acreage sustainability. And this one took on quite a bit of different meaning as we sat down um, with stakeholders in these basins. We're primarily looking at acreage in the Arkansas, South Platte, Republican, and Rio Grande. Um, all of the information that we used for, for this sustainability factor um, was based on stakeholder stakeholder interviews. And we were really trying to understand the issues facing these basins. And it, and it it's, widely, you know, varying across the board. Um, we're looking at, you know, declining aquifer levels and just whether or not the existing wells uh, would be able to uh, produce any water from these aquifer levels. We look at the availability of augmentation supplies um, and just whether or not 
any acreage is, if we're having a reduction in augmentation supplies in the future, uh, that that may prove to be vulnerable uh, or make some of this groundwater acreage vulnerable uh, in the future. So the, the range, as I mentioned, the range of acreage removed um, in these processes uh, varied, but significant reductions occurred in the Rio Grande Basin. Uh, we looked at taking about 45,000 acres out in that basin. And the Republican River um, looked at, at 135,000 acre reduction, which is nearly 25% of their acreage. So that's, it, it turned out to be a significant driver um, for some of these East Slope, East Slope basins. So now moving on to our climate adjustment, um, we're really, you know, for this one, we were, it, this was relatively prescribed and very clearly called out into the Colorado, by the Colorado Water Plan. So in keeping the direction um, from the IBCC, certain planning scenarios show that climate will change by 2050. And it was really our job to look at how that climate would impact agricultural demands. Um, so, in just kind of walking through some of the information that you that you have uh, that, that's on the screen, so really we're looking at this current is existing climate, um, and we're using that in the business as usual, weak economy um, planning scenarios, and then uh, you know as presented in the water plan, there was an in between uh, defined specifically as the the in between scenario between the current and the hot and dry, and so this in between shows some increasing irrigation water requirements, uh, demands, um, not necessarily as significant as the hot and dry, but, but we're certainly turning the dial. Uh, and we're using that in between uh, climate scenario for the cooperative growth. And then the hot and dry climate projection would then be used for the adaptive innovation and the hot growth scenarios. So what exactly does this climate factor mean? Um, a lot of the work in developing these climate projections and adjustments uh, was completed under the Colorado River Water Availability uh, Phase Two effort. And so under that effort, there was monthly factors for each water district uh, developed to basically change the irrigation water requirement um, and what it would look like under the uh, climate conditions associated with this in between and this hot and dry. So we were able to do all of our work and then apply these monthly factors. And I'll spend a little bit more time on the next slide talking about how these monthly or annual factors are, are really, um, how they're really being applied. Uh, so what I, I reiterate the fact that we got monthly and annual uh, factors because on the table on the right is really looking at average IWR increases. And I'm sure, as, as you're noting, some of them tend to be relatively significant. Uh, the way the climate factors and projections, you know, kind of uh, turned out, the lower elevations uh, had lower increases um, in the projections, and then the higher elevations had, had uh, higher elevations. So essentially what, we're, what the impact of these factors was doing is bringing the lower IWR values um, up to almost closer to a range that you would see, you know, in a hotter uh, and drier climate. So that's really the intent of it. Um, these really are averages across the board. Um, I would encourage you to look at individual water districts, um, you know, before, before applying these factors straight across the board. Uh, so, um, and then I think, you know, there isn't necessarily a comparison to uh, Swazi 2010 because this is really the first statewide climate change analysis that the state has undertaken. So we're, we're at the bleeding edge, as, as some would say. Um, so, I wanted to, so I wanted to talk through an example because I know that, that talking about vague uh, monthly factors and things like that is not something that is, that is easily grasped. So, in terms of, of what you're seeing here, um, so this is an example. This happens to be the White River Basin. Uh, we'll do full disclosure. <laughs> so what you see in the gray bars is the existing, the annual unit IWR. Um, and basin-wide, on average, over this entire period, you see lows, you see highs. But overall, those gray bars, on average, 
are 1.7 acre feet per acre. So then we have this unit value, or we have this IWR value that we can then apply these factors. And so you can see these factors um, in the yellow line as they refer to the axes on the right side. These factors range from, you know, I see one that's basically about a hundred, you know, 109%, and they extend up to, in some cases, 135%. You know, Something, a trend to, to note is that oftentimes the percentage will be higher during low IWR years. So you'll see those two um, peaks basically uh, somewhere in the 94 and 97 range. That IWR was relatively low that year. And so the compared to other warmer you know, and, and drier years, and so that factor is bringing up um, the IWR, but not necessarily at an average value or even up to an IWR that was experienced historically. So that blue bar is then the effect, it's the increased IWR uh, once you apply the factors to the, the unit IWR. Um, so in general, by the time you're looking at the in-between, uh, irrigation water requirement for the right white basin, you've gone from a 1.7 historically up to about a 2.0 acre foot per acre. And although it's not depicted on the graphic, um, a whole nother set of factors uh, was developed for the hot and dry. And if we were to apply the same process, we'd get closer to the 2.25 uh, acre feet per acre for the hot and dry scenarios. So these are significant um, you know, increases but they're a little more nuanced than just taking a, a specific uh, percentage and being able to apply it. <clears throat> so I think the last factor that we're going to, uh, or the last adjustment that we're going to spend some time with is this emerging technologies. Uh, so again, we've been saying that we needed to take that narrative out of the water plan and put real numbers to it. And this is something that the tag really had uh, quite a bit of discussion and, uh, and feedback on, is kind of how we apply an emerging technology. So what do we mean by emerging technologies? You know, when we think of seed technologies that are, you know, potentially more drought resistant, are we, are we talking about irrigation scheduling? Are we talking about you know, existing sprinkler efficiencies, you know, increasing. There's all sorts of things that perhaps are not even invented as the water plan, <laughs> you know, talks about. Uh, so we have all sorts of, uh, of technologies that we need to capture. So we did that, you know, basically in two ways. Uh, first of all, we looked at the sprinkler development. Uh, and we really looked at how much of the existing acreage is surged by sprinklers in the South Platte and Arkansas River basins, and how that amount of acreage would likely increase in the future. So in the South Platte, about 59, 60% of groundwater, of acreage only served by groundwater um, in 2010 was served by sprinklers, was irrigated by sprinklers in the South Platte. Uh, discussion with the stakeholders indicated that there was going to be a continued likelihood of this development. Um, and so they, they, implemented a uh, increase of up to 85 to 90 percent, depending upon the planning scenario of the acreage served by groundwater only um, in the sprinkler, or, or to be served by sprinklers in the South Platte. So we're looking at basically 35, I'm sorry, 25 to 30 percent more acreage under sprinkler development in the South Platte. From an Arkansas perspective, about 20% of the total irrigated acreage between Pueblo Reservoir and the state line is irrigated with sprinklers or drip systems. And the uh, stakeholders, the technical advisory group, uh, felt comfortable that doubling that, that existing amount, so then saying that 40% of the acreage between that Pueblo to state line uh, reach would be would be converted over to be irrigated by sprinklers. So we were able to, to implement those changes. Um, the next, uh, you know, impact that we were able to, or next adjustment that we were able to make was specifically for the adaptive innovation. This was really trying to move the dial on one of the, you know, this particular planning scenario based on the language that really talked about collaborative and, um, and really look, embracing new technologies. 
So in, in an effort to try to capture what that may look like, uh, we reduced the crop irrigation water requirement in this planning scenario alone um, by 10%, and we improved system efficiencies by 10% as well. Uh, and so that, you know, as you will see, once we talk about the results, you'll see how big of an impact, you know, that, that basically has. It's something to keep in mind, though, the adaptive innovation has a hot and dry climate adjustment to it. So what we're basically saying is we're applying that adapt that hot and dry climate adjustment and then reducing that by 10%, basically trying to mitigate the impacts of what climate may do in the future in this particular planning scenario. So then how do I put it all together? Um, so when we're looking at So when we're looking at um, the data that we've collected, you know, we, we had, this is going to look fairly similar to the process we used uh, for developing the agricultural demand, but we're going to talk about how we looked at each individual adjustment. So we start out with our climate data um, and our crop types. And, you know, those two things were not necessarily uh, the specific climate data. Remember, we're making a climate adjustment to IWR. So we're using current climate. Uh, we're using current crop types. And we're looking at adjustments in acreage, and we develop a revised irrigation water requirement. Same thing using the consumptive use analysis tools that we did previously. Once we have that IWR, we're able to uh, impact or apply the climate projections as applicable in whichever planning scenario we have. Then we have a climate adjusted uh, IWR as a result. Now we have revised system efficiencies. And we're able to then come up with that planning scenario, agricultural diversion demand um, for each, you know, we're looking, you know, for, for areas that we have models, we're looking at, you know, basically each ditch um, in each water district, you know, basin wide. And we're talking about doing this for five separate scenarios. So needless to say, there's, there's quite a bit of data that we're trying to keep track of and adjust um and glean results from so we're using the same process that we did to develop the current agricultural demand but we're using all the revised and adjusted information um something sorry can you go oh, back sorry. Nope, no worries <clears throat> so something also to note is that the um agricultural diversion demand we did have to acknowledge that there are plenty of of ditches that are served both by supplemental and, um, I'm sorry, both by surface water and supplemental groundwater. And so we had to partition the agricultural diversion demand between those two sources. Um, we've, we've already discussed how acreage, you know, served by groundwater is vulnerable by 2050. And so it seemed natural to assume that groundwater demands may stay the same, but at a minimum they won't, that won't increase. So we partitioned the demand between surface and groundwater um, supplies based primarily on the premise of keeping the groundwater demand to be the same and if not potentially decreasing in the future. Okay. So then we have our scenario uh, results. Um, and so instead of giving you every basin uh, by every planning scenario, I wanted to give you kind of that statewide overview. Uh, so in using the same terminology that we did before, now we need nearly uh, 10.4 to 13.6 million acre feet of diversions or pumping that we're going to need to meet 5.5 .5 to 6.2 million acre feet of irrigation water requirements. And we're going to need that for 2.8 to 2.9 million acres of irrigated land. Um, so in looking kind of at those results now in the graphical form, what you see on the left side there is the current, um, so our current acreage, and you see some noticeable drops. A lot of it's dwarfed by the amount of, of statewide uh, diversion demand that we're looking at. Um, but you see the acreage numbers. In all cases, the acreage numbers from a statewide perspective did decrease. Um, in some basins, particularly those that had those planning adjustments, they may have gone up, but as a whole, the statewide acreage uh, decreased. Um, and then you see that the IW, I, average IWR starts to, you know, be 
come adjusted in the cooperative growth and the adaptive innovation and the hot growth scenarios based on that climate change. It tends to be a, a relatively big driver. Uh, then you start to really see um, how the diversion demand, particularly again in those in those uh, climate climate adjusted scenarios, and where we really looked at efficiency changes in the adaptive innovation, it really starts to push that diversion demand um, kind of you know higher, lower um, than what we've seen you know currently. So. <clears throat> That's primarily the the big results. Um, as uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot more detail and information, basin by basin summaries of each projection, or I'm sorry, each adjustment. Uh, the results when we're looking at it from a basin wide summary are all in the documentation um, for for all interested parties to be able to look at. So then we're going to move to. What then are we going to say about the agricultural gap? So we've defined the agricultural gap as being the amount of additional water supply that would need to be diverted or pumped to meet any crop shortages. Uh, you know, as I mentioned previously, we understand that under current conditions, there are um, you cannot, that producers cannot divert or pump to meet the full amount of water that they need to meet their crops. Uh, irrigation water requirements. And that's due to limitations on physical supply or legal supply or lack of augmentation supplies, all sorts of reasons um, why producers are not able to, to do that or to, to be able to divert all the water that they, that they want. Um, from a results standpoint, what we will end up ultimately be, you know, providing is we will provide the, obviously the demand numbers. So we'll be able to look at that from a demand perspective. We're going to look at the existing gap under current conditions so that we have kind of that benchmark um, to gauge against uh, the planning scenario results. We'll look at the incremental increase, if it exists, um, in the gap between the current and the planning scenarios. And each basin and basin roundtables or stakeholders or whoever uses this data can really then decide what piece of information that they want to plan to. You know, do we want to just plan potentially to looking at that incremental gap number, or are we gonna to try to start addressing the existing agricultural gap that, that producers live with today? Um, in addition to that, we're going to provide the existing and incremental um, shortages at the crop level. So this would be more of a, of a comparison or a, a, an apples to apples comparison from the Swazi 2010 efforts. Um, it's also, you know, what we felt is relatively important to be able to provide those those crop shortages because it's really looking at a production level and potentially a financial level. You know, how much less, uh, you know, product, agricultural product is the state producing um, under each of these scenarios? So we have lots of results to look at and hopefully they're presented in a way that provides um, that that is able to uh, that basically provides enough information for people to make decisions on in the future. So we're we're getting to we're getting to the end. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how the agricultural gap is estimated, um, and I'm able to provide some insight on this because we are um, we are also the consultants on the Swazi team that are doing the hydrologic analysis. So um, I wanted to spend just a little bit of time in talking about how we feed these demands into these models and the information that we use, you know, that, that we're looking at um, to, to estimate these gaps. So we're really relying on the Colorado Decision Support System uh, state mod water allocation models where we have them available. Uh, and those models are able to uh, read in natural flow, uh, so basically our hydrology, our uh, agricultural demands, and our MNSSI demands. And again, we have five different sets of planning scenario demands. We have multiple sets of hydrology that we're putting in because the climate change also is affecting the hydrology component of this. 
And we feed them into these existing models. And these models have the existing infrastructure. They have existing operations. They have existing water rights. Um, they're, it's really a priority-driven system. Um, and these models, based on this water supply and the demand that we provide to it, is allocating water based on physically and legally available flow as defined under the prior appropriation. And so we're able to run these models and see what um, existing, basically what existing or future demands can be met under each of these hydrologic conditions. Uh, so we're fortunate enough to have these models referred to as state mod models on the western slope. There's a recent one developed for the South Platte that we were able to use. We don't have them necessarily everywhere. The Rio Grande River Basin has several RGDSS tools. Um, they rely on, con they're, they're primarily focused around the consumptive use and the groundwater uh, modeling. So when we said that they don't have state mod, it's not necessarily that they don't have the tools, they have several tools. Uh, we're in the process of trying to develop uh, a decision support system for the Arkansas River Basin, but it wasn't quite completed in time uh, for this effort. Um, and then the Republican River Basin, you rely mostly, it's, you know, 99% served by groundwater and you can rely on the compact accounting to make some, some uh, informed decisions on how that may look, how that pumping may look in the future in that basin. So for basins where we don't have the models, we're using the current demands as a maximum and we're adjusting for the planning scenario hydrology to estimate gaps. Um, you know, basically the benefit of where we don't necessarily have models is these are highly over appropriated systems. And so we do know that there isn't necessarily free river that may be available to meet increased demands. So we do have a current demand as, as set as that maximum and feel like if anything, any additional demand would likely just increase the agricultural gap. So that's how we use the tools. Um, there will be a report that, that talks about how the demands were uh, brought into the models and the results from the models, because these will essentially, these water supply results will serve as the gap um, estimate, both for m and and I and agricultural statewide. So that's very high level. Um, that's all I necessarily had for the day. Um, Potentially questions? We've got a few. Yeah, we've we've got a few questions. Thanks, Kara. That was that was a great summary of everything. Um, so we had a few questions come in on the chat, and then uh, I think we're going to unmute folks too. If you have any uh, verbal questions you'd like to ask over the phone, um, the first one we had was from uh, Laura Span and Steve Harris down in the Southwest Basin. Uh, for a large system, is the diversion amount at the main head gate or the laterals within the system? Are we going to unmute them, or should I just? I mean, you can answer. If you... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't do these very often. Um, so, I, I, Laura and Steve, thanks for the the question. Um, the short answer is that they're basically looking at the main head gate, and so when we look at um, bigger systems, uh, potentially, you know, I'm I'm thinking maybe you guys are thinking about GVIC or some of the larger systems in the Southwest, um, but we're really looking at that head gate, and we're we're looking with very few exceptions the models were set up to reflect the entire agricultural demand um, or the entire ditch represented as a single agricultural demand and so when we're looking at mutual ditch operations we have a and particularly for large systems we have a large head gate demand that we then use um, basically those irrigation practices to distribute that as if it's a uniform demand across the entire um, head gate or as get across the entire ditch. Great. Great. Yeah, thanks, Kara. Um, next question was from Steve Mailers. Um, he says, Here, here's a softball. Is it possible to indicate the level of error attributed to data accuracy, modeling estimates, scenario ranges, et cetera? In other words, given input errors and process estimates, is the analysis within 10%, 20%, et cetera? Does it vary by basin? Uh, this would help people understand how much overall contingency might be needed. Um, you know, we are, the models are only as good, uh, great question, Steve. So they're, the, the models are only as good as the data that goes into them. Um, so we are certainly uh, 
you know, relying on quite a bit of the state's records, um, as good of data as can be available. We're looking at it from a monthly standpoint. We're trying to calibrate these models over, you know, 50 years or more. Um, you know, can I put a specific percentage? Uh, you know, I basically can go back to just what the data that goes into it. You know, stream flow gauges can be between 5 to 15, in some cases, 20% off. Um, we're really trying to look at a high-level planning scenario. Um, I, I certainly didn't do an air analysis, um, but I think most folks that work in water understand, you know, how good some of this data is or is not that we're trying to use. Um, in addition, we're trying to look at 2050, you know, 2050 demands and gaps and things like that. Um, so we're probably missing the mark even more than just what the data may be uh, reflected. So unfortunately, I don't have a percentage, but we're certainly in the ballpark when we're looking at, you know, 20, 25, 30 percent, you know, depending upon what basin we're looking at. I might, this is Matt Lindbergh, I might add to that a little bit <clears throat> that um, um, it, the, uh, the inputs that we're uh, using for this uh, uh, technical update are, uh, in some cases, based on some newly available data, like the 1051 water usage data. That's going to, I think, improve our uh, understanding and accuracy of how we uh, characterize uh, municipal uh, water use. So we're making some improvements there. The report is going to uh, provide some perspective on the limitations of our analysis and, and some of, you know, if we feel like there are some areas that uh, have a particularly high level of uncertainty, we'll, we're going to call that kind of thing out uh, so people can understand uh, uh, those, some of those factors. Um, and also, you know, when we're making this future projection of demand and gaps and uh, supplies out to 2050, based on all these different drivers, um, you know, I don't think when we get to 2050, we're going to be able to trace back and figure out that, yes, we were exactly on this adaptive innovation scenario. It's going to be a mix of a bunch of different drivers. And what we're really trying to do is kind of capture uh, a range of, of future possibilities. Um, I'll add to that as well, that we highly hope that using these data sets now and in the future, in future basin implementation plan that we'll have really smart users who are the folks on the phone help us revise and refine and make those models and those those future demands even better i mean is that's that's really the hope um a lot of these modeling tools have been around for decades and every time we get someone looking at them they get better and so we are certainly and that's down to the irrigated acreage data sets that's looking at diversion records that's that's every component that goes into all of the data that we're using. So the more people that look at it, the better that it gets, and therefore the estimates that we're trying to use for planning get better. So. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Matt and Karen. Thanks, Steve, for that question. And, and I would just add as well. This is Greg Johnson with CWCB again. Um, that this is an excellent discussion and, and really sheds light on the fact that this is a broad statewide study. I um, mean, you know, we we certainly have a lot more detail this time around, and we're excited about this, and and we're really bringing science to bear uh, with our planning as much as we can um, with issues like climate change and, and population growth and, and things like that. But um, this will in no way take the place of any local uh, modeling or, or local planning that's occurring. And we're just not getting to that level of detail. It's, it's an issue of scale. Um, and certainly and on a project specific basis, um, we know that this will not be um, you know, co coming to, to, to bear on any sort of local um, issues with permitting of, of certain water supply projects. So, you know, and we'll have, you know, caveats to that effect in the report. Um, this is something that we noted in Swazi 2010 and other reports that, you know, it, by nature of what we do at a statewide level, um, you know, we just can't get to that level of detail. Um, but but it, we will have a lot of data to serve up for you, of course. Um, and then uh, the next question, uh, follow up from Laura Spann and Steve Harris again. Uh, what did you assume happened to the water supply associated with irrigated land that was urbanized? No, great. Again, Laura, Stephen, great question. Um, and this was something that was um, the amount of water that 
that may be generated from either an urbanized or buy and dry um, was was a comment that was brought up in the original Swazi 2010. So we wanted to make sure that this go around, we were able to address it and have an approach and, and really document how we're going to, to handle that. Um, what we did basically is we looked at the uh, amount of urbanized acreage and we looked at the average um, consumptive use uh, that would potentially be available on that uh, urbanized acreage and, and buy and dry. And we, and this will be a lot, this will be talked about a lot more in the water supply scenarios um, and results, but we didn't necessarily say that it was going to, we, we didn't necessarily provide it to meet the municipal gap or any other gap for that matter, but we did quantify it. We did make estimates on what we thought that that uh, the historical consumptive use or the water available from those um, from that acreage would be available to meet that gap, but we stopped short of actually applying it because I guess our methodology or our thoughts on that would that would become then a IPNP. That would be something that municipalities in the future may very well change that water and use it to meet a future municipal um, demand. But we didn't know what entities those were. We didn't try to look at whether or not they would be available from an exchange perspective or anything else. Um, to, to meet that future demand. So that's something that potentially the basin implementation planning efforts can look at. We quantified it, we acknowledged it, um, and it's kind of there to make use of by uh, stakeholders and users in the future. Yeah, great summary, Kara, great question. This is something we re really gave a lot of thought to. Um, in particular, there I believe was a white paper by uh, John Courier from the River District in response to how we had done this analysis in Statewide Water Supply Initiative 2010. Um, so this is something we really wanted to be cognizant of how we address this moving forward, but we didn't want to make some of those assumptions, as Kara noted. So great, great question. Um, and then finally, uh, we may have other, other questions that have come in, but we had one from DK with the River District. How um, to reduce crop irrigation requirement without fallowing? Um, DK, we asked you to elaborate and said that you, you might need to kind of follow up more on, on listening to the recordings that you came in uh, partway through. Um, but it seems that consumptive use slash irrigation water requirement is constant or increasing unless there is fallowing under adaptive innovation, right? Or under crop swapping. Right. Okay. So there's a lot packed in there, DK. So we'll we'll try and um, I'll try and pull some pieces out and and try and address some of the concerns. And so, um, so the the IWR is always tied to the acreage. So we did not. We didn't look at intentional fallowing to meet a gap. Um, the only quote unquote fallowing, which, you know, really to me, when we talked about the adjustments that we made, was basically acreage coming out of production completely. So that acreage, the IWR, the crop demand associated with that acreage, was removed based on either an urbanized or a groundwater sustainability issue. Um, you know, those were those were really the acres that came out of production. We didn't look at changing crop types. We understand that that may be an emerging technology. Um, that may be something that they do by 2050. We certainly didn't have the information to be able to project where that would occur, particularly as you look at changing climate, um, what crops may or may not be available or that can be grown under each of those climate scenarios was something that was that was little bit beyond the scope of this effort. Um, so we really tried to maintain crop types as being the same. And IWR would then decrease if acreage was taken out of production or increase because of climate projections. And that was really the only way that that IWR um, was going to be adjusted across scenarios. That being said, every ditch that we have represented um, has a a uh, time series of climate data that's applied to it. IWR is changing constantly from year to year, but I presume that you're talking about averages. So that's yeah, that's the only way that it's getting moved around in the planning scenarios. Great point. And I would just simply add that too, that we, we had a fairly robust discussion about the crop type issue with the TAG, with the Technical Advisory Group. Um, and there was some desire to change change crop types based on the narratives in some of the scenarios, I think it was adaptive innovation that talks about, um, you know, the locally sourced food movement growing and, and things like that. Um, but 
after much discussion with the tag, they really settled on the fact that it's almost impossible to really make those um, projections and, and really make any assumptions on that. And even year to year, you know, any given acreage that that a producer has, um, there are a million factors that go into those decisions to, um, you know, to, to switch up cropping. So um, we decided not to adjust that this time for those reasons. Um, but you know, potentially moving forward, there could be other assumptions. So. And that that's all the questions we had on on the uh, the chat feature of the webinar and and you know we we have I think unmuted everyone so feel free to pipe up with other questions or do that now otherwise I don't answer your questions in the chat we had a, a full hour and a half reserved but we're we're always happy to sort of bring things to a close we we know everyone's busy everyone should be unmuted um, so careful what you say but if you. <laughs> Have any last thoughts? Feel free to try. Um, you answered everyone's question. Thanks, Kara. Okay. Well, thank you all for your participation. Um, you certainly know where, where to find us to, to follow up with any other questions. We're always happy to, to chat more and, and uh, entertain questions or comments that you, that you have. Um, definitely stay tuned. We have got two more of these webinars coming up in May and then in June. Um, as I noted earlier, we've got the environmental methodology webinar coming in May, and then the, the one on tools and, and next steps from the technical update release um, that we'll be discussing in June, with the study itself coming out um, in July um, of this year. So we're definitely excited for, for getting all this stuff in your hands. Um, but again, thank, thanks to all for your questions. We do have forums on the website. Um, if you have burning questions about the, the two future webinars that I just mentioned, um, please let us know and we'll do our best to, to prepare. Um, and uh, look, look forward to talking with you all in, in other venues. Great. Thanks again.